Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. There is a major Sega sale happening at the moment and of course it is going to affect Total War Warhammer or Total War in general. So my, this might now be a good opportunity to buy some of the older games if you're interested in playing those or DLC for those older games. Hell, I might personally be tempted to jump on and buy some Free Kingdoms DLC at long last. I never did. But regardless though, with, uh, with this... If you're looking to buy DLC or even the games in general, I think the best deal, the best value proposition at the moment would be to buy Warhammer 1 and 2. You would get a bunch of the free content that those games have that you wouldn't have uh, access to. You'd get a bunch of Legendary Lords. So Warhammer 2 and Warhammer 1 are the best value proposition right now. Even if quite a few of the campaigns in Warhammer 1 in particular, the Empire, I'm looking at you, aren't in the best state, but there's still plenty of quality. Like, the best greenskin campaign is a Warhammer 1 campaign, so go get it if you're interested in playing the greenskins. But when we're talking about value proposition, there's a lot of discounts, especially for Warhammer 1 and 2. There are also some discounts for Warhammer 3, though not as significant. And so I start this video to talk about the Cast Dwarfs. I did a poll on the subject on my channel, and while I do respect the results of the poll, I am... I don't consider them binding results. I'm not just going to put something at the top just because it won in a poll, to put that, to be very clear on that. Unless I agree with it, uh, which I do not agree with how people view the cast dwarves. It is a 20% discount, so it is $20, 20 euros at the moment on Steam, which is a reasonable price for a race pack if that had been the base price is not the base price, so I personally cannot recommend it at that particular price. I think that Cast Orbs are one of the best DLCs Creative Assembly has ever released. I think that as a race, the Cast Orbs work the best out of all the DLC races. I want to point out that every single DLC race, with the exception of War or Two, but every uh, but the vast majority of them, Norska, Tomb Kings, Vampire Coast, they have significant issues in Warhammer Free. Tomb Kings have problems with the books and the gash. The Vampire Coast doesn't have a you know roster war for them and has horrible campaigns as a result of that. Norska is just bugged, and so on and so forth. Uh, Beastmen are not in a great state either. But let's talk about the cast orbs. Is without a doubt in my mind the best DLC right now in Warhammer Free. You get free Legend Lords. A legendary hero and you get free amazing campaigns as a result of that the mechanics of the cast dwarves are certainly good like they're the most complex economic mechanics in the entire game they're similar to troy they're inspired by troy of course and what i like about the cast dwarves for all the naysayers that were saying oh it is overpowered i think like with the cast dwarves creative assembly achieved a balance between power buying power which a lot of dlcs have been accused of between buying power but also restraining that power because with the cast dwarves yes you do have really powerful unit rosters but you have to work for it because it's dependent on the economy and i'm certainly looking forward to, uh, for future total war, game, war games including pharaoh that are going to make use of more complex economies because the limit because you're not just getting gold to use for units you have to build an entire economy you have to build uh, you have to get laborers to get raw materials, and you have to turn those raw materials into armaments, and then you can increase the unit capacity for all the good units. Otherwise, you're stuck with a bunch of uh, bad units like laborers and hobgoblins in a campaign. I think it is a good system that they do have uh, for the cast horse, because you do have the ability, unlike the Tomb Kings, who have an issue with this, you do have the ability of recruiting a bunch of units that are actually decent enough in the early game, so you get Hobgoblins, all the Hobgoblin units, including Cavalry, so you get that with no unit caps, but all the cast dwarf units, all the good units you want in the campaign are behind the unit caps. And so that's something you're going to have to manage in a campaign. I also think all the cast dwarf campaigns, be it Drazov or Astrogoth, who is uh, who's over here in Uskalak, or Zaytan, who's uh, in the Valery, they all have really interesting campaigns one way or another. Zaytan has the harshest start in a, in a way, or the slowest campaign start, and he has a lot of issues. All of them have the issue of Grimgor over here in the campaign, but there is absolutely a lot of potential and a lot of fun to have with the cast orbs. They're not a straightforward race. There's a lot of complexities you have to deal with them. So in terms of gameplay, highly recommend it. in terms of price i just can't justify it 
And I understand that for a lot of people, the price of this DLC is the price of a coffee or whatever. I'm going to say it bluntly. A lot of people don't, can't afford paying $25 every single day. And if they can afford it, they're, they're doing it on food. Like food prices have increased, energy prices have increased. Lots of people are struggling this day and age. So just dismissing that concern is honestly just disrespectful towards the many issues people deal with on a daily basis, including myself. Like you might think YouTubers make a lot of money. I can assure you we do not. And hell, I'm in a good position compared to many other YouTubers who I don't know how many of them survive in you know rich Western countries where the prices of everything are much higher. Obviously, referral links or anything like that uh, do help out. So I cannot recommend the cast orbs for this price. It is a good race for what it is. It is the best DLC in the game at the moment, quality-wise. But it's also one uh, the, uh, the most expensive DLC alongside Shadows Change, though you can get it at a better discount right now. You can also get it from third-party sellers at a lower price. I'm not interested in referral links um, with that. If I were to recommend... Any, per, any such website, I'd say Fanatical is very reliable. Others, you're kind of gambling with them, though I've never had issues with third-party websites, personally. Uh, but they're less, uh, they, their reputation is not as good as, say, something like Fanatical. But you do have discounts available right now. You have on third-party websites, and you also have on Steam itself. So if you are willing to justify, say, like $18, 18 euros for it, go for it. I think like a $20 price point would have been a good enough baseline price, but not a discount price. And number five it is the Warriors of Chaos Race Pack. Yes, I know, I'm not recommending the Chaos Dwarves, and instead I'm recommending the worst race ever delivered in the history of the game until their rework. I'm well aware of that. But it is the cheapest DLC on offer at the moment, and you do get free Legendary Lords for the value proposition. So I would say free Legendary Lords for $4, 4 euros is certainly worth it. You can get it even cheaper on some third-party websites. And the thing is, while everyone can play Bellacor by just playing Immortal Empires, by having access to Immortal Empires, I would still recommend this DLC. You do have different campaigns than Bellacor, and crucially, even if you're not really interested in playing Archeon and you just want to stick to playing Bellacor, you will be uh, be able to confederate the legendary lords of the Warriors of Chaos. Champions of Chaos is too expensive. Yes, Champions of Chaos has more on offer, but it is, what, triple the price of the Warriors of Chaos, or close to it. So, hard to recommend the Champions of Chaos at the moment. Because while that does have four legendary lords and a bunch of units, the marked units, etc., I would uh, more strongly recommend buying the Warriors of Chaos at the moment. There's a lot of fun that can be had in the campaigns, like Siv Sigvald can just vassalize the entirety of Nagaroth and turn that against his enemies, or if you choose to play as Kolek, who starts over here uh, next to uh, the Challenge Zone, you can then go on a rampage in his campaign by vassalizing Grimgore. Now, vassalizing Grimgore is brutal, but then you turn the big green brute against your enemies and watch him win the campaign for you while you sit back and do absolutely nothing. I think everyone that's played Total War Warhammer does need to experience one campaign where you just unleash Grimgore, because Grimgore as your vassal is actually more effective than when he is under AI control, shockingly enough. It's because you focus him on your enemies and you'll do a pretty damn amazing job against your enemies in that campaign. Or if he encounters any difficult enemy, you can just smash them for him as Kolik, who is also a very powerful Legendary Lord, and make that work. Arcan has a lot of potential as well in his campaign, so the, so the Sigvald has stated. So whether or not you're just interested in spicing up your Bellacore experience or experiencing the campaign as either Sigvald or Kolik or Archeon, I would certainly argue that the Warriors of Chaos DLC race pack is worth it. I'd also argue Champions of Chaos would be worth it, but at a better discount than the one they're currently offering. I would not certainly not buy Champions of Chaos at the current discount, but 50% discount for the Warriors of Chaos, sure, it's a bit redundant because everyone can play the Warriors of Chaos at the moment, but still, would highly recommend uh, this DLC because of just how cheap it is at the moment. 
And number four is the Shadow and the Blade DLC that came out for Warhammer 2. This DLC affects Skaven and it affects the Dark Elves. Now for the Dark Elves you do get Malice Darkblade as a campaign. He's okay, but he's not the best. In fact, I would much sooner play Hellebrand than Malice Darkblade. He's not bad. He is in fact very, very strong. But uh, just the campaign style that he has going for him, it's not necessarily the best campaign that you can play as the Dark Elves. However, for the Dark Elves, you do get access to one very important thing, and that is the Master Hero. So if you're looking to play a Dark Elf campaign effectively, having a lot of Masters, which can increase capacity at the Tier 2 barracks, is pretty significant. But really, it's the Skaven part of this DLC that makes this DLC worth it. Here's what you get. Even... A discounting Death Master Snitch's campaign. You do get the Master Assassin as a lore choice. Now, Master Assassins are great to have as a lore choice because they make ambushing, the ambushing Skaven playstyle much better. So if you're looking to play a Skaven playstyle uh, uh, or to play a Skaven campaign right now, there are a couple of choices that you can use. You can go with monsters, you can go with weapon teams, or you can go with Night Runners, Gutter Runners. Now, the Night Runner Gut Runner playstyle is available by default, even if you don't own any of the DLCs for Skaven. But Master Assassins make that particular playstyle that much better, because you get Missile Strength for Night Runners and Gut Runners, you get Sealed Bombs, you get better ambushing uh, chances with these Master Assassins. On top of that, the other the units that this DLC contains, some of them are very significant. The most significant is the Poison Wind Mortar. If you think about Skaven Artillery, this is the Skaven Artillery. Sure, shorter range than many other artillery pieces, but heavily armored, hard to kill, I might add. I've learned that that uh, playing campaigns against Death Master Snitch quite recently, in point of fact. And then Warp Grinders, who have, the, who have Siege Attackers and the ability of breaking down walls. So your Siege experience playing with Warp Grinders is going to be much better. In point of fact, this DLC opens up an entire new playstyle in a campaign if you're looking uh, to play a Skaven. Because you can get a bunch of Warp Fire Throwers, Warp Grinders, NES Poison One Mortars, and annihilate your enemy from range. Now, of course, a lot of people are going to ask me about Prophet and the Warlock. To be honest, I think the campaigns in Prophet and the Warlock, especially on the Lizardman side of things, but also on the Skaven side of things, don't hold a candle to how good the campaign is for uh, Death Master Snitch. Snitch is in one of the best campaign areas in the entire game, and that is Cafe. Cafe is very well designed in Immortal Empires, as opposed to Realms of Chaos. There's a lot of enemy variety, there's a lot of things to consider over here in the campaign, and Snitch also has a great campaign. Lots of campaign power, lots of power in battles, like he is damn scary. I remember playing campaigns in Warhammer 2 as Emmerich against Snitch, and the one thing that terrified me was Snitch. Not his army, not his heroes, not his not his artillery. Snitch himself would carve up, uh, carve up my entire army into tiny pieces. He was insane. He still is insane. He's one of the better duelists in the game. Not so great against the large targets, sure, but against any human-sized opponent. Snitch is ridiculous, Quite to be quite frank about it. He just has a great deal of combat power from the very beginning uh, and uh, his world world of weeping blades is pretty damn insane really when when you use it Lord. it's just going to annihilate enemies that you're gonna face on a campaign so this is the best campaign for Skaven at the moment in the game we'll see what happens in the future with some really good value in terms of the lore choice in terms of the units that you do get available and number three is the Twisted and the Twilight. This affects the Skaven and gives you access to the Wood Elves. Now for the Skaven, this will make a playstyle using monstrous units and also individual unit customization via Frot's laboratory work quite well. And with the terrain changes in Kislev, Frot's campaign is significantly better. But really the value proposition over here for this particular DLC is how it affects the Wood Elves. I would have ranked this DLC higher, maybe even rank 1 on the list, but the reason I didn't do so comes down to the fact that, well, the Wood Elves do have issues at the moment in terms of how boring they can be to play in unrepeated playthroughs, but having access to the entire Wood, El uh, Wood Elves 
with this, this DLC is certainly a great value proposition because you can confederate the other legendary lords of the Wood Elves with this DLC. So if you're looking to play a campaign where you do get access to Orion and Durfu ultimately and potentially even Draka, I think, if you play your cards right, then this is the DLC you can use. They didn't impose any kind of confederation restriction, so you don't need to own the Wood Elf race pack in order to get Orion and Durfu at the very least over here. You might need to own Warhammer 1, I'm not entirely certain on that, but you do get access to the Wood Elves, you do get access to their entire race roster with the exception of the unique units that Draka has in her campaign. Draka is a free DLC lord if you own the Wood Elves race pack. But this is the much better value proposition if you want to have access to the Wood Elves as a race. The sisters are the second most powerful legendary lord for the Wood Elves behind Orion. It's a bit of a discussion there, like what's more powerful, Durfu and Draka with their incredible Triken or the Sisters of Twilight with their cruise missile on every army. That's a decision people will have to make. But they open up a new playstyle for the Wood Elves because... Generally speaking, if you're playing a Wood Elf campaign, what you would want to do is just basically get everything from the Way Watchers perch. You would go from Glade Guard into Deep Wood Scouts into Way Watchers if you have access to them. Or if if you're playing Orion. If you're playing uh, Durfu or Draka, what you'd instead get is Tribal Stones, get a lot of Treekin, and make that work. What the sisters do, they add a new playstyle with the Warhawk Cage, and what they're all about is the Hawk Riders. So you can make entire armies Craving of Hawk Riders friend. in your campaign work exceptionally well. Because they have that Volley of Kurnus ability, which does an enormous amount of damage. To understand how powerful the Sisters of Twilight were, I recently played the Warhammer 2 campaign as Malekith, and I faced the Sisters. It was just the Sisters and... Ariel, the legendary hero that you get access for this DLC, and just the sisters and Ariel were able to potentially wreck my entire army. That's how powerful the sisters are. The Wood Elves are a slower campaign, they're a more defensive uh, campaign style, if you're interested in something like that. For someone like myself, not necessarily so, but this DLC is certainly a great value proposition. You get access to an entire race, you can't play their campaigns, but you can at least confederate them and you get access to a different playstyle for that race. Even if you do own the Wood Elves, this DLC would still be very much worth it. And you do get a unique campaign for the Skaven with the individual unit customizations that very few other people have. Like the Greenskins can individually customize unit with scrap, but it's nowhere near as elaborate as what Frot has. And while the Cast Orbs do have their own uh, customization, again, it's nowhere near elaborate as what Frot has. So Frot and the sisters, two great legendary lords, also a bunch of units, of course, for each of those races, bunch of regiments renowned, all that kind of stuff, and access to the Wood Elves as a race for a pretty good price, all things considered. Highly recommended. The only reason I'm not putting it number one on this list is not because of how people vote in the bowl, but because I don't think the Wood Elves are necessarily in a great position in Warhammer 3, just in terms of how their campaigns ultimately play out. It can get pretty boring if you're an experienced player. Still fun to play once or twice a couple of times, would highly recommend. And number two is the Silence and the Fury DLC that affects the Lizardmen and the Beastmen. For the Beastmen, this gives you access to the best Legendary Lord of the Beastmen, which is Tarox, and gives you access to their race. While you can't confederate the other Legendary Lords unless you buy the race pack, which is unfortunate compared to the Twisted and the Twilight, I guess creative is to realize there were less reasons to buy a race pack if you could confederate all of them without needing to own it. This DLC is still great. This is the DLC that brought about the Beastmen re uh, work that we all know today. And while the Beastmen do have issues within the context of Warhammer 3, they certainly are a very playable race. They're not bad, but they're just not really great. It's kind of hard to classify them in a lot of ways. They just have issues in their campaign. But Tarx's campaign can certainly still be a lot of fun. But the real star of the show is Oxyatl, Doom Guy, Rambo, whatever you want to call him. I would compare him to Doom Guy in Doom Eternal because just like Doom Guy, he also teleport uses various portals to go deal a significant amount of damage against the forces of hell itself. So here's how Oxyatl works. 
Axiatl works on the basis of making use of skinks, chameleon stalkers and chameleon skinks. And he's really good with it. This is a skirmisher army. This is the kind of army that has a short amount of range but can fire while moving and can decimate their opponents very, uh, very effectively, especially because they use poison attacks to slow them down. So this kind of arming in both melee and range is fairly effective. Not so great to not resolve, but certainly a very effective army. And Oxyatl gets various benefits to them in terms of uh, leveling up benefits. And also an upkeep benefit, minus 25% for skink and chameleon uh, skink uh, units. But the significant aspect of his campaign is that he gets these missions. Now he'll start with one that will give him 5,000 after he defeats this minor faction of corn that he starts at war with. Getting 5,000 coin just because you defeat the original opponent is already ridiculous enough. It's going to get a bit more ridiculous going forward with Oxyatl in a lot of ways. And it doesn't stop being ridiculous. Point of fact is that Oxyatl has the best Lizardman campaign at the moment. If you want to play Oxyatl with like a generic Lizardman army, like if you want to play with Saurus and Temple Guard, if you want to play with the dinosaurs, if you want to play with any of the units, you can do so. He does thrive on using Chameleon Skinks, at least for his own army, because of the various benefits he gets in his army. But at the same time, he, you can still make it work with any army. Um, with any army that you give Oxyantle. The power comes down in the faction rewards, the blessed units, the teleportation, like, hey, you want to show up and just, you get a mission to, uh, just a bit of lag there, you get the mission, um, apologies for that. Okay, you, let's say you get the mission to beat up Trash Gravendale. Well, you're just gonna show, you're gonna teleport, you're gonna get the option of teleporting. There is a cooldown of one turn with teleportation, and you can always teleport back to your capital, as well as the capstone location that you can set up with his quote unquote undercities, or his havens that you can build up, his hidden sanctums you can set up with the gems here. Like once, you've, once you get enough gems, you can build those wherever you want in a campaign and you can put the capstone to have a teleport location there but if you got the mission like let's say against Trich Craventale you can teleport to Trich Craventale you won't be at war with him and you can then just show up and annihilate his capital and I don't mean defeat defeat the garrison I mean annihilate it and then because you have blessed units uh, and then because you have blessed units in your campaign uh, that you get as a reward for these missions, like Blessed Spawnings, that every Lizardman can get, but actually just has far more of them, then you can just, the same turn that you showed up, once you've taken over a settlement, you can recruit a full stack of troops with the new Lord. So suddenly you have two full stacks of high-end units that are better than anything else that they I can throw against you. And that is the power in Axiatl's campaign. It is a great campaign. It's one of the best campaigns in the entire game. Tarx had one of the best campaigns in the game. Not necessarily quite as much at this point. But the value proposition of this DLC is, hey, you don't want to play anything else related to, to Lizardmen? Play this campaign at the very least. Even though Lizardmen are not in a great position as a race, this campaign is still worth playing. And Oxyatl is one of those few legendary lords who takes a bad or mediocre race. The Lizardmen are just mediocre. They're not horrible. But he takes a mediocre race and makes them amazing beyond any measure. He is quite absurd. I probably recommend owning Warhammer 2 uh, if you're going to play this campaign regardless, but the power in this campaign is ridiculous. Also, you're not limited by climate in any way, shape, or form in this campaign, which is always a nice benefit. If only Creative Assembly did that far more instead of limiting it behind climate. I never understood that climate situation. Was it something Games Workshop forced on them? I don't know. And finally, and number one, is the Warden and the Punch DLC for Warhammer 2, affecting the Greenskins and affecting the High Elves. The High Elves do gain something that is very important. They gain the Archmage lore type. And the Archmage lore type, since they have so, many, uh, so few mages in their campaign for such a long time, does give you access to magic from the very start. Also, they do have a negative trait that's basically pointless, so you can recruit them without penalty and without needing influence. That's the ridicule trait that only increases Phoenix recruitment duration by one. 
Now you get two legendary lords as you part of this pack. You get Alfarian for the High Elves, who is name, High Elven Batman. And he's got a unique campaign for the High Elves because he's focused on beating up greenskins. In point of fact, uh, Alfarian will start over here with a dual start in the Badlands. So he's going to be fighting throughout his entire campaign against Greenskins. Though you do start also with an army over here in Tor of Rest, and you get to decide if you want to play that dual start or if you just want to focus on the Badlands. Personally, if you're an experienced player, I would recommend uh, doing that dual start because you do have a lot of potential. You can certainly take the entirety of Evres, both northern and southern Evres. Whether or not you can keep back Nakari, that's a different discussion. But there's, there's certainly a great deal of potential in Alfarian's campaign, and there are some useful units that you do gain for the High Elves, as well as a unique campaign with a good deal of power that is yeah, different well, than every other High Elven campaign. And then there is Grom. Oh, Jesus. Grom is... well... He's insane. Grimgor is the most powerful Adrian Lord of the Greenskins, but if not for the climate limitations that Grom has to deal with, because he starts in the middle of Bretonia with unpleasant climate, it would be number one by far. In fact, it's a lot closer of a contest. If Grimgor can take Zarna Grund within the first few turns, Grom would win hands down. To understand something, Grom is in in a position where he's surrounded by factions that hate him and they despise him. The version is minus 100. That's something you can't deal with diplomacy. For instance, I had a defensive alliance over here with Carcassonne and they just broke it. So they're about to declare war on me, low and lean card, the Empire. They're all gonna be marching down, breathing down my necks. And this is after I've taken Tor of Rest. This is after I've defeated Nakari. When you defeat Nakari with the second army army, as I did so in this campaign, it ends up being pretty damn ridiculous. Of course, this this lord is best played with the King and the Warlord DLC, but I'll talk about essential DLCs in a separate video, because this is about the value proposition. You do get a great campaign You do uh, with Grom. Here's what makes him insane. So, the Greenskins in general, as a race, are absolutely ridiculous. The reason they're ridiculous is that they earn a significant amount of money through post-battle loot. I mean, their basic economy is decent enough, 250 or 250 for 250, going to 1,000 for 500. They can't trade, but they do earn a good amount of money by default. What makes the Greenskins insane is that they have the Waz, and the Waz does give the Greenskins a substantial number of benefits, growth, control, etc. But crucially, the Greenskins earn a significant amount of money post battle so looting and sacking settlements, fighting battles, they'll earn a lot of money. Like that 17,000, with that 17,000, you might think, oh, if you're losing almost 9,000 per turn, you're going to go bankrupt soon enough. I will not. As any Greenskin Legion Lord, I would not over here, though keep in mind, I've got three armies over here in Wolf 1, and I'm recruiting a fourth army at turn 20. And these armies, because Goblin Archers are scalable and good units early on, uh, and Nasty Skulkers are quite capable of defeating everything that stands against them. It gets more ridiculous as you play for the campaign and you get access to a real army of big guns, stone trolls, orc shamans, black orc big bosses. Yeah, the power is there. It certainly is there. In fact, I actually forgot to get myself a giant river troll hag over here, so maybe I should uh, engage in that. What makes Grom incredible is that on top of the insanity that the greenskins have by default, he has cooking. And his cooking is the kind, special kind of cooking. Ten growth. He starts, he'll be able to get green spores and ocean clams from the very beginning of his campaign. Ocean clams are insane because they give you 10% casualty replenishment. Casualty replenishment is one of those things that can really matter in a campaign because being able to replenish the losses you've taken is a pretty substantial benefit. And that's on top of the fact that this DLC also gives the greenskins the giant river troll hags, which also have casualty replenishment. So you're getting a great hero, uh, you're getting some of the most powerful units in a game like Road Idols if you get to tier 5. This DLC helps with the scalability of the greenskins, which are already pretty strong by default, but you get Stone Trolls, which are great units in Siege. Um, you get Rogue Idols, you get Giant River Troll Hags, even River Trolls are decent enough, so are the 
wagons. Actually, I would rather use the wagons, the chariots, if you will, versus actual greenskin cavalry. Like, yeah, the cavalry chain for the greenskins is not really worth it. Well, or board chariots, sure, fair enough, but pump wagons are certainly substantial enough in their own right. This is absurd. While I don't have a lot of territory over here, the fact that I have, like, well, to understand what I did in this campaign, you start over here. And so I beat up Bordelot, took out Bastan, took out the dwarves of Carrick of Flynn, and took out both Musulman and Leoness. And then I marched Ocean, beat up Kotik, Slanish, and Alfarian in 20 turns. And you just get more and more unstoppable the more you play the campaign, because you get more access to more cooking recipes. And those cooking recipes, they end up... Let's just say they end up being pretty damn special when you add them, like income benefits, income from looting and sacking settlements, those kind of things. And it doesn't stop there. You want to give all your goblins insane power of ammunition. So, for instance, over here, if you do a successful WA against the High Elves, you can get Phoenix Fire. That's fire damage ammunition. Or you can get Dragon's Breath ammunition which can cause explosive damage for goblins and night goblin units. If you defeat an army that has a dragon or wyvern or frostworm, I'd recommend the dark elves if you're going to go with that. Or you can leave Wolf 1 to develop that, not recommend it. But the power that Grom has in his campaign is absurd to a level that very few other legendary lords. The only thing that keeps him in check in any way, shape, or form is the climate situation. Also the multitude of enemies. To understand how powerful he is, everyone is going to ally against you and they won't be able to stop you. It's not a question if they can stop you, it's a question of how much they can slow you down. The only, and you start with the tier 1 settlement with the barracks and you're limited by climate and suitability and you annihilate everything in your path with cheap ass goblin archers. <laughs> And then you get the really good units of the Greenskins, and then you go from Annihilation to just being Armageddon. Forget Archeon, Grom is the end times. This is a really fun campaign. Uh, both of them are really fun campaigns, so I certainly have a really soft spot for Grom. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of Grimgore. He is a biblical threat in his own right. But I really like how Creative Assembly has handled the Greenskins ever since their, since their rework. And this is the DLC that brought that rework. I consider this DLC, actually both paid DLCs for the Greenskins are essential for the Greenskin experience. This is just a better value because you get the important stuff for the High Elves as well, and you get the more important stuff here for the Giant River to Troll Hag and the Stone Troll. You can play without Nasky Skulkers, they're not important. I would not necessarily play a Greenskin campaign without the Giant River Troll Hag. And that is it. Quasine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.